brought to you from Melbourne, Australia. This is the Badminton Podcast, a community for badminton players by badminton players, where we talk badminton, celebrate local heroes, interview players from all walks of life, and push you to grow as a player and a person. Introducing your hosts, Jeff and Henry. Hello, everyone out there in our badminton community. For those longtime listeners, welcome back. And if you're new and you stumbled upon this podcast, then welcome to another episode of the Badminton Podcast, proudly sponsored by Volant Wear. My name is Henry. And I'm Jeff. And we're the founders of Volant Wear, the brand that gives you badminton players and yourselves an alternative to the unsightly conventional badminton wear that you normally see on court so that you can feel stylish and confident anywhere. So in short, we make gear that makes you look great on and off the court. So you can check us out at www.volantwear.com, B-O-L-A-N-T-W-E-A-R, where you can pick up one of these t-shirts that I've got on the screen right now, if you, for those that are watching the video, for $32 delivered to your home in Australia. And you can also follow us on our social media at Volant Wear, again, B-O-L-A-N-T-W-E-A-R. So thank you for joining us on another episode of the Badminton Podcast. And before we start, I just wanted to touch base with everyone and say thank you to those who have joined us on Patreon and become Patreons. We I want to spend this moment just to reach out and I guess tell everyone a bit about our podcast and why we love it so much. So Jeff and I have been doing this now. This is over 50 episodes. We really do love it. And we've been supporting it by ourselves through our day jobs. And we're actually asking for some support where you can pledge a small amount of money, just a few dollars a month, so that we can keep releasing regular high quality episodes for you. So how you can do that is if you visit Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash The Badminton Podcast, you can play your part. We'll put the link in the description below. So again, thank you for joining us on this episode and I'll leave it to Jeff to introduce our next guest. Thanks, Henry. So today we have our first player from India. So we've had players from Indian backgrounds, but it, we've got our first one from India who's played for India in the past. And his name is Anup Shrida. He's a former men's singles Olympian who played at the 2008 Beijing Olympic Games. And he was the bronze medalist at the 2006 Melbourne Commonwealth Games with the highest ranking of number 24 in the world. Amongst his many victories, his biggest wins were over Taufik Hidayat in the 2007 World Championships, Pak Song Hwan in the 2007 German Open, and Peter Gade, or Gader, depending on where you're from, how you say it, in 2009 at the Singapore Open. In India, I would, I would go so far as to say that badminton is probably second only to cricket. Just in my city, there's I think somewhere in the region of 5,500 plus badminton courts. And that's just in my city. Yeah, there, there's over 150 academies or, or schools of badminton operating out of these courts in, in my city uh, itself. Unfortunately, we don't have a really robust system across cities, across states and across the, the entire country. And actually with, with my business partner, this is something that at least in a private capacity, we want to be able to provide. Anup, it's been a long time since we've seen each other. It's really nice to see you again and just want to say thanks so much for being on the podcast. No, uh, thank you for, for having me on, guys. Very nice to talk to you after a while, Jeff, and nice to meet you, Henry, as well. Nice to meet you, too. I should check out some of your, your early uh, earlier episodes uh, and I'll do that for sure when, when we're done today. Excellent. There's lots of episodes to listen to. Like Henry said, we are over the 50 mark, so there's plenty of listening to do. But just for the listeners out there, we spent a bit of time together, Anup, in Kuala Lumpur just before the 2007 World Championships where you beat Tolfik in the first round. I do remember that match. And I'll take yeah. some credit because I helped you prepare for that match. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really now? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> As in like we were training together. How many weeks before was it? A few weeks, I think. I think it was about two weeks. And um, yeah. I mean, not, not to correct you or anything, but it was the second round uh, and not the first round. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I remember your last shot. It was a spinning, you like, pshaw, spin forehand net. Do you remember that? I think I remember that. I think it was backhand, actually. <laughs> really? Are you sure? I'm 100% sure it was. Uh... <laughs> oh, <damn. laughs> 
No, I'm getting everything wrong. <laughs> it was probably the best match I've, I've ever played in my life. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure it was a, a backhand spin. Yeah, <laughs> okay, so, yeah. It, was a, it was just a, like a backhand clear or something, completely <laughs> not even a net run. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it wasn't a shot, but it was on the backhand side. Okay, I stand corrected. <laughs> I remember that the shuttle was just like, it was like spinning like crazy though. I do remember that. <laughs> so Anup, thanks again for joining us today. Now, we'd love to hear a bit of a background behind your story. So we usually in the podcast, we do hear about whoever we're speaking to, we hear about the badminton stories because we'd love to hear how badminton becomes part of someone's life. And obviously at the moment, you're still heavily involved with badminton. So if we could hear a little bit about how you got started, when that was and your kind of growth throughout your career as a player and then now as a coach. Yeah. We'd love to hear it. So it was, uh, I think my, my introduction into badminton was, was maybe something fairly typical for, for a growing boy in India. Uh, it was more that my parents just needed a break from maybe raising me, uh, that they wanted to find some physical activity for me to be involved in. So Perhaps I had too much energy, uh, you know, when I was growing up and they wanted me to come back home a little bit tired, so I'm easier to handle. Uh, so that's actually how I got into badminton. We had, a, a, you know, a couple of outdoor cement courts in the apartment complex where I lived. And I happened to beat in an apartment tournament, this guy who was three, four years older than me. And his mom suggested to, to my mom that, that perhaps I just uh, pursue a little bit of uh, badminton training and, and just see where that goes. So that's where it started. Of course, uh, you know, like you mentioned, we, we trained together for a couple of weeks before some of the biggest tournaments uh, that I've ever played at the, the 2007 World Champs. I played the 2008 Beijing uh, Olympics. I think I was quite competitive until around 2010 or so. And um, I had a lot of injuries, which kept me out of competition and kept me out of regularly being fit and in physical condition to, to compete internationally. By the time I got to around 2014, I had to make that decision, you know, to stop playing competitive. And I've actually been coaching ever since. I run a high-performance badminton training academy in uh, in Bangalore now. And um, yeah, I mean, to, to still be associated with the game is, I think it's a gift. And um, I love the game and I'm really happy that I'm still able to, to contribute um, in some way or the other. Yeah, it's really cool that you're still part of the sport, which um, I find that yeah, a lot of retired athletes do end up still being tied to the sport, which is fantastic because it's a sport that we love so much. When you were, I guess, towards the end of your playing career, Anup, did you have a period of time where you had to decide, you know, what's next for me? Did you have that sort of challenge? So actually, in my case, from 2012 itself, I was part of the administration or the, the management of the academy that I trained in. That kind of happened by accident to a large extent, but um, obviously looking back, it was a happy accident now. So I always knew even in the last couple of years while I was still playing that this is probably what I'm going to do uh, when I'm done being a competitive player. In India, at least some years ago, uh, uh, you know, in the recent past, um, uh, it's not been happening so much. But uh, what happens in India typically is if you're among the best in India in, in your category, especially in men's singles, uh, you typically get employed by a public sector industry. So it could be from one of the government banks, the public sector oil companies, Air India, or the Indian Railways, or something like that. So, so I was employed with an oil company from 2003 until 2015, at, at which point I, I decided to uh, obviously get into coaching full-time. So I resigned from my, my job <laughs> and uh, moved full-time into to coaching. So what kind of prerequisites do you need to have to get that? Do they train you in a certain way? So they say you're number one in men's singles. So do they require you to have any university background or formal education to employ you? Um, I mean, if you have a degree in education in, in any, any undergrad degree, you, you join at a higher level than you otherwise would. There isn't a minimum requirement because this is primarily intended to, to give you know, aspiring and promising national players uh, a sense of security so they can try to do whatever possible in the sport without having to worry about uh, you know, making a living. So it's a fantastic system. Like I said, unfortunately, in the last couple of years, the public sector units aren't doing so well in India. So um, there's been a complete freeze on, on hiring across public sector industries and um, so yeah, going forward, this this might end up being a problem, but at least back then it was it was a massive sense of security. So yeah. uh, you would also, for example, 
you know, after that world championship uh, result where I got to the quarterfinal, I actually got a promotion in my job. So you would even get promoted based on your badminton performance. Like sport performance. <laughs> That's fantastic. I actually retired as a senior manager in one of the largest oil companies in India. Yeah, wow. <laughs> what a career. <laughs> <laughs> And, and it's no coincidence, I'm sure, that, uh, you know, oil and petrol prices in, in the country have risen since I resigned. And now, of course, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I like to take credit for that. <laughs> <laughs> Just like I take credit for helping you beat Tolfik, right? Same, same, same kind of thing. I get it. I get it. <laughs> So Anup, after so many years of playing badminton professionally and then now coaching and you decided to leave your senior manager position in the oil company that I still find that so fascinating that you get promoted for the result you play in badminton. That's awesome. That, that's so cool. Um, <laughs> so in terms of the sport itself, there must be a good reason why you are still in the sport. And we do love to talk to badminton players and coaches about why, why are you still in the sport? What do you love about it so much? What, what does it give you that maybe something else, maybe a senior manager position didn't give you? Um, so there's a whole bunch of reasons, but what it comes down to is um, if I'm able to give to um, you know, aspiring, promising players in India uh, what I had and, and if I'm able to what I did not have uh, while I was pursuing the sport, I mean, to try to do that is why, why I'm still in badminton. There were, for example, other opportunities I could continue on with my job or there were a few other business opportunities that were uh, very interesting. But, you know, obviously I had a, you know, I'm married, uh, I have a four-year-old son. So, uh, of course, I had a, a talk with my wife and I told her that, I mean, growing up, I was incredibly lucky to be selected and to be chosen to train in, you know, an elite academy uh, that was founded by Prakash Padukone, India's first All England champion. So I wanted to be able to give something back. I don't think I was born to play badminton, but I, I grew to absolutely love it. I think the sport is so fantastic. It hasn't yet got the, the recognition and perhaps the, the fame and, and certainly the money that, that it deserves. And if I'm able to play any part in trying to see that it, it sort of gets to the level of, or anywhere near tennis, for example, that that's what I want to do with my life. That's really exciting, Anup, because that's something that Jeff and I are really passionate about as well. <clears throat> and why, one of the reasons why we started Volant Wear is really to celebrate the sport of badminton and hopefully invite more people into the sport. And yeah, it's, it's really inspiring to hear your story and um, how you've actually come back to the sport after playing professionally when you could have progressed your career as a senior manager and then step your way up in the oil company as well. Partner. Yeah, yeah, partner, director, whichever, whichever it might be. So, um, yeah, it's really exciting to see that you're, yeah, you're, you're being able to contribute back to the sport that has given you so much. And as part of going from the player to coach, is there anything that the sport has taught you or being a coach has taught you that you didn't learn as a player? Um, so I think um, Jeff might know a little bit uh, about this, but I'm certainly uh, a whole, whole lot more patient than I was before and far, far less aggressive. I think uh, things have changed massively there. Of course, getting married and then becoming a parent probably changes more of that than anything else, especially becoming a parent. But yeah, uh, being a coach is like being, uh, I don't know, like a guardian of, I have around 70 odd students that are sort of under me along with, uh, I mean, I have about eight assistant coaches and uh, there's about 70 odd uh, students that I, that I train. So from being extremely sort of obsessed about something like uh, maybe my recovery back into the court from an overhead position, for example, you know, these 70 players have 70 different issues every day. So, you know, you have to be mentally really, really available. Uh, uh, you have to find a way to be able to figure out some things that you haven't dealt with yourself. So, so this is all the fun part, but then it also requires a, a huge amount of patience. And I think... Um, I've developed a lot of that over the last five years or so since since I've been coaching. And yeah, being a coach is definitely something that, I, I don't know, I had the, the same perspective as you in that it kind of mellows you down a little bit because I guess as an athlete, you do everything for yourself, right? And it's like, I need to perform, I need this, I need that. But then as a coach, you have a lot more of a group mentality. So it's not about you anymore. It's about what can I do to serve the players? What, what's going to be best for the players? And I think that mentality changes a lot. And if we kind of 
segue now into Indian badminton in general, because like we said before, you're the first Indian guest that we've had on here, other than um, others that are from in, like, Indian background. Like we've had uh, Rajiv Usuf on the podcast. We've had Rajiv Rai from the US. So we'd love to talk to you a little bit about Indian badminton. And I'm not very aware of the system in India and how you actually get from your local club to say, a, I don't know what level, then the state level, then national level. Like how, for someone that is listening that maybe they're in India or maybe they just want to know about how the system works, what's a pathway that a player needs to take in order for them to start and then progress to national level and then maybe get a job as well? Like because they're in the national team. And an oil company. <laughs> and, a, and an oil company. Or, or the metro or the the, yeah. the planes or something. Oh, yeah. Um, so I, I'm not sure those those public sector jobs are available anymore, but but then uh, I get I get what you're saying. And Unfortunately, we, we, we don't really have you know, a really strong system of coaching across the cities in India uh, or a standardized set of coaching systems uh, across India. Most of the time, what happens is there are private clubs and private academies all over India. For example, in my city, uh, just in my city, there's, I think, somewhere in the region of 5,500 plus badminton courts. Wow. Um, yeah, I know that's, that's crazy. And that's just in my city. Yeah, there, there's over 150 academies or, or schools of badminton operating out of these courts in, in my city uh, itself. So most of the time what happens is there are players that compete initially within their district and then move on to state level tournaments and then further on to the, the All India ranking tournaments. And if you fall within a certain ranking or uh, you've impressed the, the selection committee of the, the National Association sufficiently. You get called to attend uh, national camps at, at one of three places in India right now. The main center being uh, Gopi Chand's uh, Academy in, in Hyderabad for sure. Uh, there are a couple more national training centers in India, but by far the academy that uh, most people want to be in or at least want to end up in is Gopi's Academy in, uh, in Hyderabad. Unfortunately, we don't have a really robust system across cities, across states, and across the, the entire country. And actually, with, with my business partner, this is something that, at least in a private capacity, we want to be able to provide. So, for example, we, ha we have uh, a really strong curriculum, a set of uh, workshops and training programs for coaches, and assessment systems and things like that for coaching, especially at the beginner and intermediate levels. Because at the, a slightly higher level, you have around seven, eight uh, really competitive, very strong uh, training centers across India. But I think the, the lower level of coaching, uh, beginner and intermediate coaching, which, which is so important to form the right basics, this is largely ignored. Ideally, you would have the National Association taking charge of something like this, but it doesn't seem to be uh, one of their priorities right now. So... It's, uh, it's, it's up to, to some private organizations to, to see if, if they can bring in a system of curriculum into coaching. So uh, standardization and regularization of coaching across cities and across states can, can happen. So we're, we're trying it, but I mean, we're, we're still a private company and we're still a small company. So we will need some time before we are effective on a national level. Yeah. And so does that mean that the, there's no centralized national team for India then? So there's a few different national venues. So there, there are three national training centers, as they're called, with, like I said, the, the main one being the one in Hyderabad, which uh, Gopi Chand is, is based out of. But for example, like in Denmark, you know, you have uh, this fantastic club system and, and they work very closely with, uh, you know, the National Federation with DBF and, and they're able to pool resources, talent and, and ensure that if there is talent somewhere that it is fully exploited and, and that player is given every possible resource and, and encouragement possible. Unfortunately, in India, there, there isn't very, very good coordination or, 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 or something like that between uh, private and public. The National Training Center, the National Association, the, so it's called the Sports Authority of India from the, the central government. There, there isn't enough coordination between these three areas and uh, if, if there can be at some point, I think um, we will uh, lower or substantially eliminate the risk of talent, you know, slipping through our fingers. I think there's, there's tons and tons of talent in India that, that's just waiting to be explored. But badminton is an expensive game. You, you, you travel around the world playing tournaments and 
almost even at the highest level unless you make it to like a quarter final or something you you can't even make back the money you spent traveling there this is a huge problem so you 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 need funding and and india is not 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 a rich country so we we need a lot of coordination and partnership between public and private uh, sector and um, you know i think that will be uh, hopefully the future of badminton in you know in india and maybe sport in india actually yeah so what defines which national center someone goes to then is it choice or is it men singles in a certain one or lady singles in a certain one or is it just location yeah so i think it will end up over a period of time maybe the next few years being like you just uh, mentioned men singles at one place and okay potentially men doubles at a place or the doubles events in one place and the singles in another and perhaps the, the junior teams at a third location but presently if you are a player who's done well at the, the national level you're given a choice of where you want to to attend the camp of of the three places you're given a choice presently yeah okay it's incredible to me i know like I had no idea that India was like that cuz I guess from my exposure to badminton and they watching the international scene I would have thought that India had a robust system to develop their grassroots level badminton players because of how they shown up on the on the badminton map um so to speak as of recent times I would have thought that it would be rather systematized and that you could really develop these um players and pull talent quite easily but it it sounds like from what you're describing that it is a huge numbers game from the sounds of it especially with the yeah the, the huge number of courts you have just just in your city there must be you know a huge amount of players that do fall through the system unfortunately that could have become you know some really talented and successful players unfortunately for them then now i guess and if you look back into history say the last 20 years ago you know india didn't produce you know the, the some of the like really top badminton players in the world they didn't have quite have those really high results that we're seeing in the last you know 10 15 years or so we we talked about how that there hasn't been much coordination between the public and private sectors if you were to look at it has there been much improvement what do you think has actually changed or has anything changed to to end up developing um these great players Yeah so so there's a few things and uh, to be honest the biggest reason right now perhaps over the last 12 12 years or so 12 maybe 14 years or so there there's been a, you know a huge push by by Indian badminton and I'm I'm sure even a, a you know a Chinese player or an Indonesian player or a Danish player coming up against an Indian player now would take them would take us a lot more seriously than before so there's two reasons the first and in my opinion the biggest reason is is simply Gopichand Mm, I was going to ask you about him. Sure. Yep. And what he's doing. Yeah, I think he's been the biggest reason. Honestly, single-handedly has uh, I mean it it's difficult to say single-handedly and it is perhaps not fair but but at least as far as coaching is concerned, he's taken um, I'm sure when you compare with developed countries, um, he's taken very very limited resources that he had available to him uh, when he became national coach in 2006. Uh, he's just worked honestly uh, maybe 14 16 hour days and he's just uh, managed to to pass on all of his knowledge experience and everything that he knows into all of his players so the the first thing that's changed actually um, is that indian players now believe that they are as good as anybody else in the world i think the belief uh, for the longest period of time was was simply not there i think that the talent in india has always been there but i think uh, physical fitness and belief were the two areas where indians majorly lacked when compared to the chinese or indonesians malaysians danes everybody else right so i think this is where we lacked but um, i certainly won't take too much credit here people like saina you know have have changed the perception of indian players especially in women singles to a very small extent perhaps uh, players like chetan anand arvind bhat and myself we were able to perhaps do that to a, a you know a smaller extent and uh, the the younger players after us have just come in believing that for example they can also beat tofik they can also beat uh, peter gate they can they can beat a linda and even you know some of the the juniors have done that and so they they come in believing these these things and that they're not inferior to or smaller than or or easier to to play against than uh, anybody else you know so i think the belief coupled with the the massively improved physical fitness of these players especially gopichand's players from hyderabad these have been the two major points of difference from 20 years ago to to today 
I actually haven't said this before, but uh, in the last couple of years, unfortunately, the results haven't been fantastic. Apart from Sin- apart from the World Champs last year, where Sindhu obviously uh, crushed Okuhara in the final, and uh, in the men's singles, we had a bronze medal as well. Apart from those two uh, results in the same week, the last two, perhaps two and a half years, have not been great, especially if you compare it to the, the two and a half uh, years that immediately preceded it. So this is again, um, I mean, coming down to a point now where uh, Gopi speaks about it quite often. You know, it can't be just about him anymore. I think a lot more former players need to get back into coaching, need to get back into the sport as much as possible into the high performance level, the elite level, and and share everything that they've learned. And um, if we lose this opportunity, we because of Sindhu and Saina and Srikant and of course Gopi primarily, we've had tens of thousands of kids uh, take up the sport in the country. We have so many more players at the beginner level, which means that many more at the intermediate, that many more at the advanced, and obviously that many more at the elite levels. If we, as you know, as, as a country, the national association, the uh, you know, from the, the central government, if if we don't grab this opportunity. To have this sort of an opportunity again, or to be at a time like this again, will will be very, very hard. It'll take, I don't even know how long it will take, but we have to find a way to ensure this talent is not wasted. I, I tend to be perhaps uh, a little more on the, the optimistic side always, but um, I think if we are not careful, we can very easily slip into uh, another period where we, we don't have uh, the high level results again. So I think it's very important that we, we, we grab this opportunity right now. Yeah. It's kind of like a self-revolving machine, isn't it? So we just need something to get it started, like say a Sine doing the, getting the results or yourself or like beating Tolfik or Shikant now and uh, Sindhu doing what they do. Right. And then it, all of a sudden on the back end, there's more players and then more players, more players at different levels. And then you can keep creating. And then it's just that thing. So yeah, I completely understand how important it is to make use of the volume of players and interest in badminton now. I just want to go back to what Gopicham was doing. And I know that you said maybe not single-handedly, but he had a large influence on the way Indian badminton was built. When you say that he spent those days, was that with the players? Was it like with the players on court training, physically coaching, or do you think it was more on a higher level on strategic planning and that kind of thing? Um, so initially, actually, a lot more of his time was was on the court. Okay. He he firmly believed that uh, the system of badminton that we need to, as Indians, uh, follow is is more of perhaps the Chinese uh, system, which is a lot more aggressive, perhaps maybe even a little less skill based, uh, and a lot more physical. You know, so so you have to be. I mean, in in badminton terms, you have to be able to over a period of three games be able to to play smash net, basically. You know, you need to have the fitness to do that, even if you don't exactly do that through through the match. And then you have to be fit enough to recover in a few hours if you have another match in the day, and certainly recover by the end of the day to be 100% again for your match tomorrow. So the initial few years, I would certainly say that he spent a lot of those hours on the court. What traditionally, you know, Indians used to, to do in training, I think went up maybe threefold in the space of, I think, maybe six, 12 months. Um, the amount, I, I remember attending a few camps in, in Hyderabad as well and being completely overwhelmed by the training. I remember just thinking by the end of Tuesday, I was, you know, I, I'm done for the week. I can't take any more. And uh, you, you don't have a choice here. You know, you, you if, if you're told to do something, you're going to do it. It's as simple as that. But um, unfortunately, you know, personally for me, I think perhaps my, my body wasn't, used to that level of, of physical work and you know I ended up breaking down somewhere or the other I had a ton of injuries but then that's the system which which has served the, the the next lot and the younger lot extremely well so while personally I, I made a few changes uh, wherever I needed to but the next lot and and then the, the next couple of generations have have benefited greatly by, you know from it and like I said I mean again uh, single-handedly is is a difficult thing to say but then I would almost give him 90% of, of the credit, uh, you know, if you had to put it in, in, in percentages. Yeah, certainly sounds like all the, all the top players have come through his training, um, his vigorous training. And um, we're talking about the people, the players that have benefited from that um, 
and the successful iconic figures in India, for example, Saina, uh, Nawal and, and PV Sindhu. Let's talk about them and uh, you know, how do you feel that they have helped to promote badminton the way that they have over this you know, five to 10 year period? And like, do you think that they've had a significant impact on the popularity of the sport? Um, I think especially in the case of Saina and Sindhu, it's really been massive. They're superstars in, in India. I would even perhaps hazard a guess as to them most likely being the highest paid female badminton players, perhaps of all time even. So it, it's very important for a sport that's finding its way uh, and then trying to bring more popularity and fame into it to have stars like these. And Saina and Sindhu have been absolutely fantastic for the sport in India and especially perhaps for women's sport. I mean, they've just uh, elevated the status of badminton in India. And I, I would even honestly credit Saina the most for, for, for this. Uh, right from 2006, when she won her first Grand Prix event in the, the Philippine Open, until I think uh, she even won the, the individual gold medal at the Gold Coast Commonwealth Games two years ago. She's been unbelievable. I always feel, I mean, I've spent so much of time with her and um, I've seen her perform uh, and, and win all of these massive events. And I've always felt she's like the badminton version of, of Rafael Nadal. I think mentally, she's just unbelievable. She'll be perhaps in pain, recovering from some injury or the other, in terrible form, and maybe it's not a great day for her. But her mindset is and her, her mental strength is just so strong that she will just do everything possible to, to find a way to win. And it's, it's just so inspiring to, to see her, you know, even on some of her bad days, she's found a way to win. And uh, I, I think this message perhaps needs to, to get out a little bit more in general, but, but certainly in India, because certainly in the past and, and unfortunately in the last couple of years, we and a lot of our, our players seem to be uh, finding problems rather than solutions. And Saina would just be the other way. You know, didn't get to hit in the morning, no problem. A little bit of plantar fasciitis in your in your feet, no problem. She would just try to find a solution rather than look for more issues and more problems. She, she's unbelievable. And uh, she deserves a huge, huge amount of credit. I mean, Sindhu is no less. The way she's come in and uh, certainly the last few years, you know, she played final after final um, and she wasn't really able to win, you know, a massive title. And then she did so last year in, in unbelievable style. I thought that might be the craziest score in a world championship final. And then Momota beat Anders, I think, something like 21-9 and 21-2, half an hour <laughs> later. <laughs> and I was just like, what the hell, man? <laughs> 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 this can't possibly be a world champs final, you know? But yeah, uh, Sindhu and Saina certainly are uh, a major part of the reason that, that badminton is, is popular in, in India. And uh, nope, just listening to you talk about Sina like that, that's exactly what I feel as well. Like sometimes it looks like she's not having a good day, but she just wins with guts. Like it's just raw guts strength. And it's just sometimes I think, whoa, how did she actually win this match? She's just so strong. Absolutely. I mean, she's like that off the court as well, you know. I think it's something I share with with all my players now that I'm a coach, is it's it's very difficult to to be a different person off the court and then a different person on the court. So I, I might be getting into or stepping into coach mode here. So, so please bear with me. If you can't find discipline in your life off the court, it's not impossible, but it's, it's very, very hard to find it on the court. You can't be uh, like a schizophrenic person, you know, a split personality here and there. It, it doesn't work. So she, she's just like this off the court as well. You know, Gopi is, I think, a big part of the reason she, she has this attitude because, again, when, like I said, especially when Gopi started coaching, especially when he just became national coach in 2006, the, the resources available to him were very, very little. I remember, I mean, this was a national training center and we had no gym. Uh, so we just had a, a small room with, frankly, a few uh, rusty barbells, weights and a few dumbbells. And he just found a way to educate himself on what best to do with that equipment. We had a really nice badminton hall. Uh, so we made maximum use of it. And we had, uh, this is this is again uh, one of the, the, the positives at that point, but we had a, a fantastic badminton hall and we had unlimited shuttles. This itself was a huge thing uh, back then. And 
So we made full use of that. And um, Gopi is like that as well. He always looks for solutions. If X isn't there, then perhaps Y will suffice. Or you can make do for a certain period with, with something else, you know. And in general, you know, I, I think Indians are fairly adaptable. But we need to remind ourselves of that because the last couple of years, I think we are looking more for the problems and, and, and perhaps not the solutions. Yeah, that's really interesting. And that, it's funny how you talk about that mindset on and off the court. And it, it's, it's your identity, isn't it? It's your, the identity that you gravitate towards. It's hard to live outside your identity. So if you want to have your identity of someone on the court, then quite often you need to have it off the court because it's, it's hard just to change just like that, right? Absolutely. I think that's, yep. that's completely. Mm-hmm. And so if we talk about badminton in general now, Saina and Sindhu and a lot of Indian badminton players like yourself just are helping to build the popularity of the sport in India. And obviously we know that cricket is absolutely huge over there. Like cricket is, I don't know, life over there, I think. And the amount of money and people who play and everything in cricket is huge. But although badminton probably isn't quite there like cricket is, it's getting closer to being on par with sports like tennis. Is is that correct? Um, so actually, in India, I would I would go so far as to say that badminton is probably second only to cricket. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah. We we we've, we've actually gone we've surpassed um, tennis in in that sense uh, in that sense in India. But obviously, uh, you know, we as a sport we have a long long way to go. I think uh, football, soccer, and basketball, funnily enough, are sort of making rapid. Uh, rapid and giant strides in India now. Like like I said, I mean, I'm obviously extremely biased, you know, in favor of uh, badminton, towards badminton. And I really want to see the day where, look, uh, we will probably not be on par with cricket for several decades uh, yet. But finding a little bit more parity uh, rather than being 90, 10, perhaps, you know, even 75, 25 or something like that over the next few years is actually possible over the next five years or so. This is doable and it is possible. We have an association now and a president of the association who's very forward thinking, who wants you know more people involved, not less, and not fewer people holding all the authority. I think it's up to a lot of the former players now. I think um, if we can all find a way to get back in the sport, I mean, it, it's very tempting to get into the business side of, of, of the sport rather than the high-performance coaching because while it is fun, it, it is also very hard. So uh, it is very tempting to do that. But the more of us that get back into the, the, the sport and, and share everything we've learned, I think uh, the faster India can, can get to where perhaps it, it, it deserves to be. Yeah, I know that you said earlier, you know, you're a bit biased, but there's no better place to be biased about badminton than on the badminton podcast. So um, okay. I'm glad you're here. And um, with that, I mean, there are certainly a lot of challenges for the sport, um, whether that be in India, Australia, or around the world. I mean, it is a very popular sport. A lot of people do play it, but it just doesn't get the recognition that, you know, you, me, and Jeff feel that it deserves, and I can, I can see that. But as you said, you're hopefully getting to a 75 versus 25 against cricket in India is, is a good goal to, to aspire still. to. And it would be huge, absolutely huge. And hopefully that will help to... I guess, engage the, the public and private sectors to coordinate and build a more robust system so that you can actually develop those players and create more PV Sindhus, create more Sina Noels, create more Anup Sridhars out there so that the world can, yeah, all the world and India can see how amazing the sport really is by seeing these types of players. So Anup, we're actually sort of wrapping up with our podcast now and we've really enjoyed um, having our chat today. But before we finish up, well, I do want to ask you something, and specifically for the Indian players out there that might be listening to the podcast, because we've had a couple of Indian players, junior aspiring players, reach out to us uh, via our social media as to, you know, what, what can they do to be better as, as badminton players? And this is before I realized the, how disconnected the various levels of badminton as far as development's concerned in India. So if you could tell these young aspiring badminton players in India or around the world, three pieces of advice that you could give to them to develop into a more successful player or just to improve that little bit more than they have, what would you say? First thing I would certainly say is that um, to achieve anything, you have to aim high. 
it it doesn't matter if you don't achieve every single one of your goals but if you don't even aim high and um, set really high standards for yourself uh, it'll almost be impossible to achieve it so i would certainly say aim high the the, the second and you know which has to be paired with the first is you have to work hard hard work a lot of it involves physical work but it's not all physical work only hard work also means smart work so for example uh, when i was training something that i always was was very weak at was being fluent in my footwork so i had to do a lot of footwork training shadow training which we all know is it's extremely boring but it needs to be done you know uh, if you want to be better as a player you have to do it so so work hard but work smart as well if you're already good at something find a way to maintain it and work on the areas where you're a little bit weak and the last and most important thing perhaps which ties everything together is do a lot of research educate yourself about who is the right person to train under find the right coach but then trust that coach take all the time you need and and do all the research to find the right person uh, but once you find the right person please put your entire trust in him or her because you know if if there's constant second guessing uh, of of what the coach tells you to do i think um, neither the coach nor the player will ever achieve what they they set out to do so so i would certainly say that that these these would be the three most important things to to take care of awesome awesome and i just want to reiterate that last one that you said and up yeah just not from the player's perspective but it's a two way street isn't it the player and the coach it's it's always a two way street and even if you're doing what the coach is telling you but the coach feels that you don't think it's going to work or it still has a big effect on the coach and the whole training program as a whole so just you doing it that i think that trust is really huge because as a coach you can feel when the player trusts you as well and when you feel that then you can get to one get to talk to them better you're more open you can talk to them about what they need what they feel they need what you feel and it, it just becomes a much better relationship that can develop into something better rather than just yes listen to the coach and do what they say but it goes deeper than that yeah Okay, awesome. So, Anup, if there's someone listening out there who is thinking, "Hey, I really like this guy," and of course, I've heard his name before, and I want to find out about his academy, is there a way that they can get in contact with you or the academy, or find you on your website or Facebook or Instagram or anything? Um, so, anybody that interested can just mail me at anupshridhar dot b a at gmail dot com. That's a n u p s r i d h a r dot b a for badminton academy at gmail dot com. Perfect, and we'll put that email in the description of the podcast as well. So make sure that you do contact Anup there. Anup, just a quick question that just I thought of: Do you accept any international players who want to potentially train in the academy as well? Um, so we do actually. We are in maybe around three months or so moving our high performance center to a different center. This is going to be twelve uh, badminton courts, a badminton specific uh, gym which will be around thirty five hundred square feet, you know, with with accommodation, food, and and everything within one center with physios, doctors, trainers, everything. So potentially be around October, November or so. But but yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. And and we haven't put anything out so far for international players because we're waiting to make the move. Uh, but we will certainly be accepting players from anywhere in the world, especially once we move there. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. So a great opportunity for anyone in the world who wants to train under a noop, which he's going to make you train hard because you just heard him talk about how physical is so important, but also a really good guy as well. I've known you for a little while as well. And a noop, you're awesome guy. And anyone out there, I do trust him if you ask me. So go uh, make sure you check him out, email him and be in touch if you do want to find out about when you can go and train with him. But from us here from the Badminton Podcast, we're finishing up here. So Anup, just want to say thank you so much for coming on and sharing your expertise, your knowledge. And I've learned a lot about Indian badminton as well. Thank you for, for having me, guys. All the best. Excellent. So from Henry and I at Volantware and the Badminton Podcast, for all the listeners out there, thank you so much for tuning in. Make sure you do share this episode with your friends, your family, other players, teammates, etc. And if you're a coach out there, share it with your students as well because there's lots of invaluable information that we've talked about and potentially um, some training overseas opportunity if you're not in India. 
in itself and in the city there. So make sure you do what you can do to be the best badminton player you can be. That's all anyone can ask and really just get out there and don't be afraid to go for your goals. Set your goals up really high, like Anup said, because you never know what you can achieve until you actually try. At the end of the day, it's all because we love the sport. And if you're listening to this podcast, you probably love the sport as well. And we just want to show the generation, generation after that, how much we do love the sport so that we can grow it to maybe in India to get it on par with cricket. <laughs> Absolutely. And if you want to connect with us or even tell us how much you love the sport, we'll be able to connect with you like that as well. So you can find us on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, and TikTok, as well as on our website, www.palantware.com. Our social media handle is also Palantware as well. Uh, don't forget to check out our Patreon and support us if you can. If you can't, that's okay. We'll still continue to produce episodes because we love doing this so much. And also feel free to reach out to us and just ask any questions. Give us any requests on topics or guests that you'd like to have on the podcast. Uh, we're here to serve you. So thank you so much. And we'll see you on the next episode of the Badminton Podcast. Thanks, guys. Thank you. This podcast was brought to you by Volantware, the most versatile badminton apparel you'll ever own.